Hello friends, Patrick McFarlane here of the Liberty Weekly Podcast, and welcome back. This one is episode 100, and my apologies that I'm not doing anything super duper special. Uh, As you might know, as I think I said in the last episode, I've been pretty preoccupied with work and a bunch of personal stuff going on here. Uh, Going back to our regularly scheduled content here, though, uh, is my goal for the next week or so, and... The big news is is that I brought on Keith Knight, who is the new co-host of the show. Keith is a amazing podcaster in his own right, although he doesn't have his own feed, special feed per se. Um, so I thought that I could give him access to my audience as well, and he brings so much to the show. It's just been a great pleasure working with him and working with him in the past as well. So this is the first uh, high-profile interview that is going to air in the Liberty w- Weekly podcast that Keith has done himself. And so in this episode, it will be Keith's interview with David D. Friedman, who is a, a great libertarian scholar. He is the son of Milton Friedman, which is a comparison I'm sure he gets tired of hearing over and over again. Um, However, this is that interview. It's a really great one. Just a few announcements, and I won't won't dilly-dally here, but just a few announcements. We have a new patron, and uh, we are so grateful for this new patron. His name is Kyle uh, Roussis, and I'm sorry, Kyle, if I'm butchering your name or... um, Rusis. He has a website that is kylerusis.com. It is uh, K-Y-L-E-R-O-U-C-I-S.com. He is a software engineer and a game designer who has just recently kind of ventured out on his own. And I had a good time kind of looking up his projects here. He has founded what is called Big Byte Studios Incorporated, and they have a YouTube channel that I'll be putting in the show notes page here. But he is designing his own video game, which is called Seeds of Earth, and you can check all that stuff out on his YouTube channel. Uh, it looks pretty cool. I'm sure it'll be launching on Steam here. So go check out his content. Uh, great Liberty Lover who is helping to support the Liberty Weekly Podcast. And of course, you too can support the Liberty Podcast the Liberty Weekly podcast by going on over to patreon.com forward slash Liberty Weekly. You can join at different tier levels. You will immensely, immensely help out the show, help us to cover our operating costs as well as upgrade some equipment here. Uh, For $1 a month, you can get a shout out on the show just like this and a personalized email thank you from me. There are also other tier levels that you can check out. Bonus content, that kind of stuff at patreon.com forward slash Liberty Weekly. Also, don't forget about our email list if you would like to receive email updates of the show and uh excuse me the occasional update from me i send out some uh personalized stuff well not personalized but i send out some of my own email content a la tom woods does with his list Um, but you can go sign up for that at libertyweekly.net forward slash email one word e-m-a-i-l or go to libertyweekly.net and hit that Uh, email list sign up in the first horizontal menu bar there also don't forget about our amazon affiliate links uh just go to libertyweekly.net forward slash amazon you can do all your regular amazon shopping uh at no cost to you and the liberty weekly podcast will get a cut so i'm not sure yet which uh book that keith and i will be covering here in the near future i have a few episodes planned as well on some shenanigans happening uh, in Wisconsin in the prison system. So I think that should be pretty interesting. Um, but look forward to that maybe at the end of this week. So without further ado, here is that great interview that Keith Knight did with uh, David D. Friedman. Thanks, everybody. The direct use of physical force is so poor a solution to the problem of limited resources that it is commonly employed only by small children and great nations. Probably my favorite quote from this excellent book, The Machinery of Freedom, by David Friedman. You can find Mr. Friedman's work at daviddfriedman.com, where you can also find PDFs of his books, both nonfiction and uh, his novels. Uh, And that's where you can find his blog. Mr. Friedman, thanks so much for uh, taking the time. Happy to be here. I don't think I actually have the text of either of my novels there, although I do have a link to recordings of my first novel, but I do have the text of a number of my other books uh, in one f- one form or another, HTML or page images or depending which book it is. Oh, okay. That's, uh, that, that must have been the link I was looking at. Um, 
How would you define capitalism and why is it morally superior to socialism? Huh. That's hard to answer because the word socialism means a lot of different things to different people. Uh, I think of capitalism, it, let me go back a step. All societies face what economists call the coordination problem that in order for anyone to do anything, you have to somehow coordinate the activities of a very large number of people. That uh, famous example was that to make a pencil, you need wood. Uh, to get wood, you need chainsaws. To get chainsaws, you need steel and fuel and a bunch of other things. So if you push back that supply chain, making a pencil involves a million people more than a million probably, somehow coordinating what they're doing. So there's enough steel to make enough chainsaws, to cut down enough trees, to make the number of pencils you want to make. That's a grossly oversimplified version. And there are basically two solutions to the coordination problem. And the obvious one doesn't work. Uh, the obvious one is to have somebody at the top telling everybody what to do. And that works for very small groups. If you think about sort of a football team or a small firm with a few employees, you can have one person more or less making the decisions. But it scales very badly. And when you have a large society, it, it turns out that the problems with trying to run it that way make it pretty much unworkable, uh, which is part of why the Soviet Union didn't work and why China stayed poor until Mao died. Uh, the alternative method and the non-obvious method is some decentralized system where each individual has a tiny bit of the problem that he's solving, how much he wants to make, how much he wants to consume and so forth. And you have some mechanism to coordinate signals among those people. So that the fact that I need steel shows up from the standpoint of the steel manufacturer as the price of steel being higher, which makes it in his interest to make more steel. That's again, a, vast oversimplification of a semester or two of, of price theory and economics course. But the basic argument is that the solution that works, and there are a number of different variants of it, is some decentralized one in which each person is controlling a tiny bit of the problem, that being typically the problem for which he has the best information, so that I know more about what I can do and what I want than you do. And decisions of what I consume and produce in part depend on what I want and what I can do. The other part, depending on what other people want, is handled to me, handed to me mostly through the price system, that I observe that people are willing to pay for certain things, that makes it in my interest to produce them. I observe that people charge me for certain things, that makes it in my interest to consume them, only if they're worth more to me than the cost of making them. And again, that's a very, very sketchy description of a much more complicated argument. But basic point, point I'm making is that Capitalism is one label for the system in which we use private property and trade to get a decentralized solution to the coordination problem, to get a way in which we can somehow coordinate so that there's enough of everything done without having anybody in charge. Uh, and I was told that an American economist uh, spoke to a Chinese visitor. This was quite a long time ago. And the Chinese visitor was part of the department in China that was responsible for making sure that all the firms had the inputs they needed. And he wanted to know, he wanted to meet his opposite number. He wanted to find out who in America did the same job. And, and the answer was either nobody or everybody. That is, there is no one in charge of that. And in a sense, everybody's in charge of that. When you decide that you would like uh, to have ice cream with your dinner, uh, that sends a very weak signal via you are buying some ice cream at the grocery store and the grocery store order, ordering some ice cream from its suppliers and its suppliers ordering inputs for ice cream from the people who produce the inputs. But you are, in a sense, doing a tiny bit of the signaling, which is controlling uh, the allocation of inputs. Is that, it's a long answer, but I'm afraid there isn't a short answer that is useful. Sure. You uh, begin your book with a defense of property, basically saying that it's understood operationally pretty much by everyone, but intellectually by no one. Why uh, is it important to have a proper intellectual understanding of property? Because private property is the machinery that lets us do the trick that I was, was describing, that, that one of the problems that libertarians have to face 
is that we would lo- what we want is a world where everybody controls his own life, which sounds like a wonderful ideal until you realize that everything you do is dependent on lots of other people. So we have a highly interdependent society and that property gives you the solution to that problem in the sense of giving a way in which you can define my controlling my life, which is consistent with interdependence and still actually re- actually works. And that's that I control what I own, which includes most importantly me. You control what you own. If I want to get something from you, I've got to make you an offer you're willing to accept. Uh, unless what I want is for you not to take my property and then I'm allowed to use force to stop you from taking my property. But it's a way of breaking the world up into tiny bits with each person controlling one bit. And it's hard to see any other way that you could, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't think we've imagined all possible human institutions, but it's hard to see any solution that doesn't come down to some variant of that. And of course, there are lots of different variants. That one of the things you economists realize when they study law is that property is a much more complicated idea than, than one at first thinks. So that you say, well, I own this house and land. What rights does that give me? It doesn't give me the right to prevent somebody else from standing outside my property and talking to his friend, even though that affects my property because I can hear him from there. It doesn't give me the right to prevent my neighbor from turning on the light in his living room, even though the fact that I can see that light means that there are photons that he's creating that are trespassing on that property. So it's it's actually quite a complicated uh, concept. Uh, I believe it is the case that I own, along with my house, half the width of the street in front of my house, because the house, I believe, is older than the street. But I am confident, uh, since I observe cars going along that street, that long ago, some previous owner of the house, in effect, sold the city of San Jose the use of that bit of his property. That's what we call an easement in property law. So you can think of my ownership of land as sort of a bundle of rights, And one can sometimes take one piece of the bundle and transfer it to somebody else because that strip of land was worth much more to the city of San Jose to have a street on than it was to me to have a little more grass on or the previous owner of my house 80 years ago or whenever the transaction was made. Uh, So property is not a simple idea. And if there are any lawyers listening, they already know that, but most other people don't. But it is the, the basis to the problem of deciding who gets to use what when how are pro- how what gets produced what gets consumed and so forth i once asked a woman who was saying capitalism's terrible it's exploitative um it hurts the poor it <laughs> creates poverty she even said and i said how would you define capitalism and her face turns white and she goes capitalism is when the rich get richer and the poor get poorer you have a great chapter in your book titled The Rich Get Richer and The Poor Get Richer. If I'm a poor person, why should I want or advocate capitalism? Well, empirically, of course, uh, if we look at more or less capitalist societies, we observe that in the more capitalist societies, the poor have gotten richer. Uh, sometimes they've gotten richer faster than the rich have gotten richer, sometimes slower. That, that varies. Uh, In a sense, one of the most interesting experiences from this standpoint I've had was visiting in India, because India is a country that has been nominally socialist since it came into existence. Uh, It has always considered itself socialist. India is also feels to me as a visitor, like what Russians imagine capitalist societies must be like, because it is a society with a mass of very poor people and a small number of relatively well-off people much, much more strikingly so than the U.S. or Western Europe or Hong Kong or Singapore or Taiwan or any of the more nominally capitalist capitalist countries. Uh, I gave a talk at a sort of the equivalent of a business school in a city in, in India. Uh, it had been initially subsidized by the government, although I think they claimed they were now paying their own way. And it was very lovely. It was about a half mile rect- square, roughly rectangle, of forest and grass and buildings, lovely place, surrounded by a high wall topped with barbed wire. And that's the image that the critics of capitalism have and is in a society which at least claims uh, maybe an exaggeration to be socialist and and always 
always since that government existed, since it became independent of England, uh, has been. Uh, but if you ask what's in a sense the more relevant question in our context, which is why should you want the kind of, want the society to be more capitalist? Then you have to ask what are the ways in which the governmental parts, the non-capitalist parts, are making poor people better off or worse off. And both of those exist. That you have welfare transfers, which certainly helps some poor people. You also have rules for professional licensing, which says that if you want to employ yourself as a barber, depending on the particular city you're in, you first have to take several hundred hours of classes in how to cut hair despite the fact that lots of people, lots of parents manage to cut their own kids' hair with no particular difficulty, that if you want to be a flower arranger, you've got to pass a test, and the people who are already flower arrangers are typically in control of that test and use it to keep down the competition. So there are a bunch of ways in which the path up is blocked. One of the ways which is less obvious and which people will disagree about is the existence of a minimum wage law that a minimum wage law sounds as though it ought to help the poor by giving them higher wages. But the problem is that when you raise a price above the market price, that means you're raising it above the price at which the amount people want to buy equals the amount people want to sell, which in this case means you're raising it above the price at which the number of unskilled workers employers want to employ is equal to the number who want to work. So that typically the result is that when you push up the minimum wage, you are pricing at least some low wage laborers off, laborers off the market. So the result is that instead of getting a low wage, they get no wage. And that's a particularly serious problem because typically the low wage job is the first step in a ladder, not necessarily a ladder to being rich, but a ladder to being less poor. That part of the way you get a decent job is demonstrating that you come to work on time and are hard worker and don't steal stuff and things like that. And you can't demonstrate that if you never get the first job. Now, people will disagree on this. And it's an open question that if you raise the minimum wage, some people will get higher wages. Some people will lose their jobs. You don't know on theory how big those two effects are. But one of the effects, at least, is to make it harder for people who were poor to stop being poor. One thing that I found striking a long time ago was looking at the pattern of the poverty rate in the US. And roughly speaking, using a constant definition of poverty, the pattern is that from the after World War II, which is about when our data go to, from then until the point when the war on poverty was declared, the percentage of the population that was poor was falling pretty rapidly. From the time when the war on poverty got fully funded, got fully into operation, the percentage of the population that's poor, at least by the statistics I looked to a few years ago, has been roughly constant, going up and down with general economic conditions. Now, that certainly isn't a proof. You know, you, correlation is not causation, as people correctly say, but it at least suggests that the war on poverty whose declared purpose was to make people no longer poor. The declared purpose wasn't to make it a little less unpleasant to be poor, which is what it ended up doing. It was to provide retraining and other things such that people would end up with good jobs and be self-sufficient. That never happened. Uh, there's an interesting book by Charles Murray, his first book, I think, called Losing Ground, which is a description of that process of how you started out with policies whose declared purpose was to make people no longer poor. They failed. And as it became clear they failed, they sort of retrofitted it into a policy, into a program for making poverty somewhat less unpleasant. Uh, so, you know, it's hard to prove anything to anybody, uh, at least any reasonable person who's as skeptical as you ought to be of people trying to prove things to you. Uh, but I think if you compare uh, the situation of even the poor in a country like the U.S. with the situation of the average people, say, in the Soviet Union when it was communist or in China when it was communist, uh, which are relatively extreme cases, uh, the poor in America are quite a lot better off, and that's true in, in other countries. Now, of course, none of these countries are fully capitalist. We don't have the experiment of saying, suppose we have what I would want to have, what I argue for in the book you were referring to. Those data aren't available, unfortunately. But we can say that on the whole, if you compare more capitalist and less capitalist societies, and we've, we've had a a number of pretty, about as close to controlled experiments as you get in this field, because we had East Germany and West Germany, which were culturally the same society, and one of them was under a communist government, and one of them under a more or less capitalist government, and after 
that separation existed for what 50 years or so. Uh, it was clear that East Germany was a great deal poorer than, than West Germany, uh, enough so people, some people were willing to risk their life to get across, to get out. We have had the example of North Korea and South Korea, where again, you are starting out with more or less the same society and you have ended up, you've probably seen the satellite photos people show of the Korean Peninsula at night. And it's quite striking because the South half is lighted and the North half is black because there isn't enough power there so that ordinary people have their lights on at night. Uh, and of course, there's lots of other evidence that things are much worse off there. And we had, in a sense, an even bigger and more interesting experiment with China because to begin with, we had China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. So those are three places with culturally the same the same population. Singapore, you could argue, was a fourth. And while China was under a explicitly socialist and communist system before Mao died, uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore were all getting, by their standards, rich, and China was standing still. Uh, that uh, Hong Kong is the a striking case because in terms of material resources, Hong Kong was probably the poorest society on earth. Uh, back a long time ago when people were, when people believed that the reason poor countries were poor was overpopulation, uh, I did a very simple calculation of population density, just people per square mile for every country in the world. And it turned out that the five most densely populated countries were two rich European countries, Belgium and the Netherlands, and three poor countries in the process of getting rich, Taiwan, South Korea, and Singapore. Singapore had the highest population density of any country in the world. Hong Kong, which was not an independent country, had 10 times the population density of Singapore. So you had a basically uh, a place with no natural resources other than a good harbor a place that had to import drinking water from China because they didn't produce enough for their population, which had masses of poor refugees coming in. And some decades back, the per capita income of Hong Kong passed that of England. Uh, so that's a sort of an extreme case. And again, it's not a perfectly capitalist society, but it's a great deal more capitalist than the alternatives. But then you've got the, in a sense, the most dramatic example. And that's what happened to China after Mao died because I expect that both Mao and the rest of the top people in the Czech Communist Party were mostly well-intentioned people who wanted their country to prosper. Uh, when Mao, they all believed in socialism. When Mao died, the others were now free to go abroad. And what did they observe? They observed that their country with what they believed to be the best economic system in the world was dirt poor compared to the rest of the world. They could look at a place like Japan, which isn't very far away, and see that the Japanese, ordinary Japanese workers were enormously better off than ordinary Chinese workers. Uh, so what was their conclusion? They were still socialists, but they said, we must be doing socialism wrong. We're making some kind of a mistake. So let's experiment. Let's let people do things and not stomp on them. Uh, and they tried in a number of ways to change their system. And some of them made it a little bit better and some of them didn't. But meanwhile, things were happening on the margin, things were happening that the Communist Party had not decided to have happen, but when it discovered, didn't stop, uh, of which the most important one was the shift to something close to private property for agricultural land, where what happened was that there were a number of very poor villages, which covertly assigned plots of land to families, to households, and let them be responsible for cultivating them and getting the crop from them minus whatever they had to contribute for their share of the, of the common. Uh, in one village, it was done covertly by the local communist official. And in one, in one village, it was done covertly by the peasants not telling the communist official. In both cases, the result was that what had been very poor villages did much better. Eventually, they went public. And the response of the Communist Party was, this is illegal. You're not allowed to do it, but we aren't going to punish you. And they watched for a while, and then they said, well, in those villages where the present system is working very badly, you're allowed to try this experiment. And they watched for a while, and then they said, everybody should do it. So that was a case in which it wasn't that they figured out what to do. It was that they had the good sense to realize they didn't know what to do, and thus not to stop what was happening. There's a very interesting book by Ronald Coase, who was a very important economist who died a few years ago. His last work 
was a book on how China went capitalist. Bunch more stuff. I'm, I'm summarizing a, a, a lot of stuff from the book. But the basic bottom line is that between Mao's death and 2010, the per capita real income of China went up 20 fold. It's probably the largest increase in human welfare that has ever happened in that short a period of time in history. And that was the difference between a socialist system and a more or less capitalist system. And again, it's certainly not a pure capitalist system. Uh, I would say that Shanghai, where I visited on paper, in theory is a little bit less capitalist than America and in practice is a little bit more capitalist than America. That as far as I can tell, there are various regulations, but if you know who to pay off, they don't get enforced. Uh, other parts of China are probably less capitalist than that. I think Shanghai is one of the better areas. But Ch China, in terms of the economy, is not strikingly less capitalist than the U.S., Western Europe, Canada. Uh, and it is enormously more successful than it was when it was a real communist society. They still call themselves communist. Uh, they kept changing the label. It was socialism with Chinese characteristics was what they were doing because they couldn't say it was capitalism. Uh, but nonetheless, it's essentially a largely private property market exchange society in which the government owns a bunch of firms and meddles in a bunch of other firms and does a lot of other stupid things just like our government does. Uh, but it's still a whole lot better than what they had before. So I think that would be, those are some fairly striking pieces of evidence uh, that uh, capitalism on the whole is good for the poor as well as as well as for the for the rich. Ben Shapiro had a discussion with Sam Harris and Sam Harris said there is one argument that I basically cannot get on the capitalist side for. The reason we can't really have a market society is because of the existence of market failure. You've actually given a presentation on market failure. Yeah, How do you address the market failure concern? Sure. sure. Let me first give what I think is the best definition of market failure, because it isn't really about markets. Uh, what market failure is, is a situation where individual rationality does not produce group rationality. That is, where you have a group of people, each of them is making the correct decision for himself, and yet all of them would be better off if they did something else. And my favorite example, the story I like to use when I give a talk on this, is to imagine that it's a thousand years ago, and you're somewhere in Europe, and you're one of a line of 10,000 men with spears. And the reason you are standing in that line with your spears pointing in one direction, pointing north, is that north of you, there are another 10,000 men with spears on a horseback and they're coming at you. And you do a very quick cost benefit calculation to decide what to do. And you say, well, if all of us stand and if we keep our spears planted and pointed at them, with luck, we can stop their charge. And some of us will be killed, but most of us will survive. If we run, horses run faster than we do. I should stand. Then you think a minute, you say, wait a minute, I'm making a mistake. I said we. I don't control him and him, the guy on either side of me. I only control me. If everybody else stands and I run, one man out of 10,000 won't have much effect on the chance of stopping the charge, and I won't be one of the ones who gets killed. If everybody else runs and I stand, I'm dead. In fact, whatever everybody else is doing, I am better off running than standing. We all run and most of us die. Welcome to the dark side of rationality. And that's a particularly dramatic example, but it's a problem that exists in lots and lots of other contexts. And you can find, if you go on my webpage, I've got a link to recordings of talks I've given, and you can find it there. Or if you read my book, Machinery of Freedom, I've got a chapter on it. But this, the logic of such a situation happens in lots of contexts of which the market is only one. And what's basically happening is that I'm making a decision where I get the benefit and other people get the cost. And in that case, even if the cost is larger than the benefit, it pays me to make it. So when I run away, the cost is that the whole line is a little bit less likely to hold. That's a cost spread among all 10,000 people. The benefit is I'm a little farther ahead and might get away. So it's in my interest to do it, even though we're all worse off as a result. Uh, the standard example in the textbook is something like air pollution, where when I... When, when my factory puts sulfur dioxide in, the, dioxide in the air, that imposes costs on the people downwind. Uh, 
but I ignore those costs. It makes it cheaper for me to make steel. So I do it that way. Even if the cost of filtering the smokestack and preventing the sulfur from going into the air is less than the damage done because the damage is done to other people and the cost of the filters would be to me. So these are situations where individually rational activity on the market may produce the wrong result. And it can also go in the other direction. If you have a case where I bear the cost and you get the benefit, again, even if benefit is larger than cost, it doesn't pay me to do it. Those are the economists often refer to that kind of case as an externality, but it's really a pretty general pattern and it describes market failure and it sometimes happens on the market. And the result is that a market with no government intervention sometimes does the wrong thing. That's absolutely correct. The problem is that we have no better alternative because if you think about the alternative to the market, it's having those decisions made by the political mechanism. Why do you expect the political mechanism to do the right thing for the group? And if you think about that for a little, you realize that the, me the machinery for getting the government to do the right thing is run through with market failure. So if you think about the sort of simple model of democracy, which is why does the government have to do the right things for us? Because we'll vote them out if they don't. For that to work, the individual voter has to know what the government is doing and what it should be doing. Answering both those questions is hard. That when a politician introduced a bill into Congress, he never says, this is a bill to make farmers richer and city folks poorer. <laughs> Even though every year we have such a bill, it's called the Farm Program. He will naturally present it in a way which is designed to make it look good for everybody. And then you have to pay some attention and some effort to figure out it isn't. As far as I know, no politician ever runs on the slogan, I'm the bad guy. So again, in order to figure out, in order for that mechanism for controlling government to work, each individual voter has to put quite a lot of time and effort into figuring out what the government is doing, what it should be doing, what the particular politician he's voting for or against has been doing, what he should be doing, and so on. This is not a trivial problem. There is essentially no benefit to doing that because if I do that in a presidential election, my voting for the right guy instead of the wrong guy increases by about one five millionth the chance he'll get elected, right? We've got large populations here. Exact numbers are really complicated, but that's the right approximate number. So if the right guy gets elected, that benefit is spread among 300 million fellow Americans. I get a tiny fraction of it. I bear all of the costs of my decision to make it a little more likely. That's an extreme externality, an extreme case where I bear a cost, and everybody else gets the benefit. So I don't do it. And the result is that in practice, there many people believe that they are rational voters. But if you actually ask them, I've done the experiment when I was teaching an undergraduate class in uh, university in Silicon Valley, of asking my students, most of whom, almost all of whom were old enough to vote, if they knew the name of their congressman. And about half of them did. Really hard to keep track of what a politician is doing if you don't know his name. Uh, and in general, if you, when people do polls, uh, the population vastly overestimates the size of some parts of the government budget, such as foreign aid, underestimates others. And that's perfectly rational because the information in order to be a well-informed voter is quite expensive and it's rational not to buy information if it costs more than it's worth to you. But the result is that the fundamental mechanism that's supposed to make our political system work is one where market failure is not the exception, but the norm. And that's true if you run through the political mechanism, the governmental mechanism, it's true right through it. So you might say, well, the reason the system works is not really democratic voting. That's sort of the, the cover story. It's really uh, market corruption. It's really the fact that if some, if some bill benefits your group, you're willing to offer congressmen donations if they'll vote for it. If it hurts your group, you're willing to vote, offer donations if they vote against it. So you have a sort of a market for legislation in which people might say, if it's worth more than it costs, the winners will outbid the losers, so to speak. The trouble with that is you again have a market failure problem because if my group of people, let us say the contest is between the producers of automobiles and the consumers of automobiles, and the question is, shall we have an auto tariff? Shall we make it expensive to import foreign automobiles? And the American auto companies would like to do that because it means they can charge higher prices for their automobiles. The American consumers would like not to do that because it means they pay higher prices. 
The American auto companies are a handful of large organizations plus one big union. They can pretty easily get together and say, look, we all contribute 50 million. If you contribute 40 million and if the United Auto Workers tells all its people to vote for the guy we tell them to vote for, and we can thus push for the tariffs. The victims are, what, 100 million people who are going to buy automobiles. There's no way they can get together from the standpoint of each one of them. It isn't even worth the cost of finding out whether the tariff hurts him, let alone doing anything about it. And, you know, I, I go into more detail on this elsewhere. But the basic argument is that if you think about the sort of cynical version of why it works, it still works very badly because you heavily overweight the interest of organized interest groups of relatively small numbers of, of large players like the auto industry. And you underestimate, heavily underweight the interest of large numbers of dispersed, disorganized groups such as all consumers. So again, uh, sort of tariffs are a case which are sort of striking for an economist because the relevant economics were worked out by David Ricardo a little bit over 200 years ago. Uh, we've understood them quite well ever since. The implication of those arguments is that with certain rare exceptions, a country that imposes a tariff makes itself worse off. Uh, that, that quite aside from what anybody else does in response, the tariff in effect means that we are producing goods at home and we get them more cheaply by producing something else and trading it for, for those goods. Uh, and yet for those 200 years, almost no country has followed the logic of that argument and had no tariffs. The England in the 19th century was a famous exception and it did very well. Hong Kong in the 20th century was another exception and did even better. But those were very much the exceptions. Almost every country uh, has had tariffs. And the reason is that a tariff is a way of benefiting a concentrated interest group, namely the producers, at the cost of a dispersed interest group, namely the consumers. Uh, and the result is that it's politically profitable to have it, even though it makes the country worse off. Uh, so those, those are an example. But the basic point I'm making is that the, choice, the alternative is not do we have a laissez-faire free market, which works perfectly, uh, is, sorry, is a laissez-faire free market work, which works imperfectly or have the government correct its mistakes. The alternatives are between a free market system, which mostly works and occasionally doesn't, and a al governmental alternative, which occasionally works, but mostly, but mostly does not work due to the fact that the same problem of market failure is the exception on the private market. Most of the time, if I want an input, I have to pay for it. Most of the time, if I produce an output, I can sell it to someone, so I get paid for it. And only in some special cases, like a radio broadcast where I can't control who hears it, or uh, air pollution where I don't have to pay for the people who are injured by it, only in those special cases does the free market give the wrong answer. Whereas the political system is one in which the normal situation is it gives the wrong answer. Because almost without exception, the actors in the political market neither bear the costs nor receive the benefits, uh, all of the benefits of, uh, of their action. Uh, it's true of the politicians. It's true of the lobbyists. Uh, it's true of the administrators, uh, people who are enforcing the rules. It's true of judges. If a judge sets a precedent, which is the wrong legal rule, if that legal rule makes the country a hundredth of a percent poorer, a hundredth of a percent of the national income of the U.S. is something in the tens of billions of dollars a year. It's an enormous amount of damage for a human being to do, and yet he'll never know. He's not paying for it. So it's not like a system where it is in the rational interest of judges to make the right decision, or of administrators, or of politicians. Uh, so what you want to do is to think of the government not as a sort of a god reaching down from behind to fix things, but is itself a market, a system which the individual actors are acting in their own interest. The only difference is that it's under a set of rules in which the conflict between their interest and our interest is normal, whereas on the market it's exceptional. It does sometimes happen, that's perfectly true. So that would be my long answer. Uh, but I don't think I have had the opportunity to argue with Harris, so I don't know if I could persuade him of that or not. All right. So the other day in the Wall Street Journal, this was on the cover, the iPhone. Now, uh, it, so basically this article says if you take each part of the iPhone and add them up, it costs $390. However, 
the evil, greedy capitalists are charging $1,099. The average person might look at this and say, okay, I could see 400 or 500 or 600, but how can you charge so much more? This is ridiculous. How would you approach well, this how subject? Would you worth? Suppose we think about all the stuff that goes to make up you, and it all only comes down to a bunch of carbon and a bunch of hydrogen and a bunch of water and a certain amount of nitrogen and oxygen and a few other chemicals. And I think if you valued up all of those chemicals at market prices, I doubt you're worth as much as 20 bucks, probably less than that. Uh, me too. Uh, so the problem is that you're taking the individual pieces and you're ignoring all of the costs that go into assembling them, designing them, uh, marketing them. You've got to get that phone to somebody. Uh, so there are a whole bunch of costs other than the literal costs of the pieces that, uh, that go into it. And I think the real answer is that Apple, after all, has to compete with Samsung. Uh, they have to compete uh, with uh, Huawei. They have to compete with a bunch of other firms. Uh, they even have to compete with tiny firms. Let me show you uh, a toy that I acquired not long ago. Uh, there used to be a personal digital assistant called the Scion, made in Britain, which I loved dearly. And it was basically a miniature laptop. This was before cell phones. And what was amazing about it was that it had a keyboard you could actually use. That they had some kind of a magic spell or something on their keyboard, so that in, this, in the size of the form factor of what I'm holding, which looks very much like a Scion but isn't, you actually had a real keyboard with uh, movable keys that you could type on. And some people in England, I think a couple of years ago, who like me remembered dearly their old Scions because it went off the market many years ago, decided to create a cell phone based on the Scion design. And they put it up on Indiegogo, which is one of these websites where you get funding for new projects. And I was one of the people who offered money to be one of the early buyers of it. And I ended up getting it. That's a tiny firm. I doubt that there were as many as 20 people involved in the original group, from what I can tell. I don't know. Uh, it took them, I think, a couple of years. Uh, it costs, I think, less than half what that iPhone does. On the other hand, it's got some disadvantages compared to the iPhone that I haven't actually switched to making it my main cell phone yet because I'm still figuring out how to use it. And it's a little bit less smooth than the Samsung I've got, which costs twice as much. But if it was really true that one could produce a phone as good as the iPhone for $400, I got a feeling somebody would be doing it. It's not as if there is a block which keeps people from starting new cell phone companies. I'm giving the example of Planet Computers, the people who make my uh, little machine, which I say it's, it's a very pretty machine and called the Gemini. And I expect at some point I'll switch my SIM card to it and make it my main phone because it would be really nice to have a phone I could really type on. I would, no longer have to lug around my laptop all the time in order to type on it. Maybe younger people have gotten good on these virtual keyboards, but I've never gotten to be able to use one decently. Uh, so in fact, there's, it's a world out there where if you really believe that for 400 or even $500, you can make a phone as good as that iPhone, you ought to be out there making it and selling it for 550 and becoming a billionaire. Uh, but somehow uh, we observe that the companies that are making phones at the level of the iPhone uh, which is basically Samsung and, and Apple and a few others, also end up charging roughly similar prices. Uh, occasionally, somebody comes in and disrupts it. There is a, I forget which company, but there's one of the smaller companies now which has a phone which is noticeably less. It's not, I don't think it's $500, but it's noticeably less, which some reviewers think is as good. But it, that's all in sort of the margin of how well you can do it and what features it has and, and, and all the rest of it. So... So the basic answer is that just looking at the pieces that make it up doesn't really tell you the cost of bringing it to market and distributing it and selling it and telling people about it and all the other costs associated with that. Bernie Sanders was debating Ted Cruz, and he said, you can't be free if you don't have health care. You can't be free if... The government doesn't regulate such and such. The leftists will look at the economy and say, well, first you need uh, the state to control a great deal, and then you can be free. Why is why is that an incorrect way to look at freedom? Yeah, to be, there are really two different issues. One of them is definitional, and one of them is sort of real-world economic. And the definitional issue is 
the distinction which I would make the distinction between freedom and power. That I would have said that if I am dying of an incurable disease, I am still free. I am just very unfortunate. I don't have very much power. And of course, we all are dying of an incurable disease. It's called aging. I'm farther along than you are, unfortunately. Uh, but, uh, but that freedom, I think, is usefully, at least one useful way of thinking about it, is to what degree what you can do is constrained by other people by other people forcing you to do something, not allowing you to do something and so forth. And in that sense, the person who is dying of cancer is still free, even though he's very unfortunate. Now we value both, of course. I, I don't want to be dying of an incurable disease. So one point is that that I think uh, Sanders is confusing, well, not confusing is unfair, he uses words as he wants to use them, but he's not making an important distinction between having your choices constrained by the fact that other people are stopping you from doing things and having your choices constrained by the fact that either you can't do things or other people won't help you to do them. So I guess I would ask Sanders whether if he is in love with a woman and wants to marry her, her refusing him is a violation of his freedom. Because in his terms, it is. That's something he desperately wants. He can't have it. And he can't have it because she refuses to marry him. All right. And yet I, I'm not sure he would be comfortable with saying, therefore, we should have the government intervene and make sure if you're enough in love with a woman, they make, you, make her marry you, which would, in a sense, be the logic. But the second question, the first question is, is this really what we want to call freedom? But the other question is, is he right that people would have more power, would have more control over their own lives if we did it his way instead? And I think... In a sense, I've already answered that question twice. That is, we've had a whole bunch of examples where you had two societies in one of which uh, resources were allocated primarily through the market and in one of which they were allocated primarily by government decision. And we can observe that we ended up with North Korea, much, individuals much worse off than in South Korea, East Germany, individuals much worse off than in West Germany, Maoist China, individuals much worse off than in Taiwan, uh, or Singapore, or Hong Kong, or modern China, no law, which, which has shifted largely, though not entirely, to having things allocated on the market. That, after all, the fact if, if the fact that a government makes a decision doesn't mean it'll make the right decision. Uh, that you mentioned earlier, the fact that I've written a couple of novels. The second one was called Salamander, and it was a fantasy, and it started out the original idea was the fantasy version of what I think of as the central planning fallacy. And the central planning fallacy is the idea that there's all this stuff out there, people, labor, materials, and so forth. If only some sensible person had control of it, what wonderful things he could do. And that seems very plausible. And there are three things wrong with it. One of them is forgetting that all those things are already being used by the people who own them for their own purposes. So in order to be able to give you something, we've got to take it away from somebody else. And then the question is, is it really true that whoever decides what gets taken and what gets given has got everybody's best interests at heart? Why would you expect him to any more than you expect anyone else to have everyone's best interests at heart? Second thing wrong with it is not realizing how complicated a problem it is. That goes back to my pencil at the beginning to figure out what everybody should do. And the third thing wrong with it, which I've touched on, is assuming that whoever controls it will be a good guy, that he will in fact be acting. And so in, in Salamander, I had a world where magic was very weak, where a fire mage was more like a match than a blowtorch in terms of the power he had. And a brilliant, naive young magical theorist thinks up a way in which one mage could pull in the power of everybody around him, funnel it through him, and finally do real things. And that's like the central planning fallacy. It's the idea of all these little bits of dispersed magical power are only controlled by one person who could do wonderful things. And he's making the same mistakes. So in the story, he is the uh, he's one of my protagonists, and the other protagonist is an equally br brilliant female student. And he tries to persuade her to help him with his project to develop this spell. And her answer is... Uh, my mother is a healer. I have seen men with gaping wounds that she has closed. When you have taken her power to end a flood or a plague, on whose hand is the blood of those she cannot heal? 
That is, she is making the point, which he has been forgetting, that he's t- got to take away from all these people in order to, to, to use it in the way he wants to use it. And they already are using their power for what they think are important purposes. And in the same sense, uh, if uh, Sanders sets up a system where the government decides who gets medical care and who produces medical care and how, that's got to mean controlling people and making them do what he wants them to do, not what they want to do. Uh, now, the novel, you also end up with a bad guy sort of take, trying to take it over, which is one of the problems. And the third problem with central planning I never get to in the novel, because I like to say that no plot survives contact with the characters. So the story went the way it wanted to go instead of the way I planned it to go, which was fun. But, but the basic point I'm making is that it isn't a choice between having things done the way the market does and having them done right. It's the choice between having things done the way the private market wants them done and having them done the way the political market wants them done. And the way the political market wants them done does not consistently lead to the kind of outcomes that Sanders uh, would like. That if you look at how what governments absolutely sub- actually subsidize, they subsidize opera, which is consumption of the rich, not of the poor. They subsidize, heavily subsidize college uh, education, which is a consumption not of the rich, but of the top third or top 40% or so of the population uh, with general taxes. Uh, Some things governments do help the poor, that's certainly true, but a lot of things that governments do uh, help other people at the expense of the poor. And a lot of things governments do just make all of us poorer. And that's often not visible, that when when, when Trump puts up a tariff, that's really imposing a cost on ordinary poor people who have to pay more for their shirts. Uh, but you don't know, you know, the shirt doesn't have a note on it saying 15% of the prices is, is due to the tariff. Uh, so that's invisible, but it's nonetheless a very real cost. I have about 10 more questions for you. Could you do a lightning round as in give me a one minute or less answer? I can try. All righty. Capitalism creates inequality, therefore it's immoral. How do you respond? Uh, The fact that human beings differ creates inequality. As far as I can tell, all political systems end up with inequality. Uh, Capitalism creates wealth that makes people better off. Some people it makes a lot better off, some people not so much better off, very few people worse off. That's a net benefit. How would you define government? That, I, I spend about a chapter doing that in, in, in the third edition of Machinery of Freedom. My short answer is that all of us have lines we believe other people can't cross, that all of us have this sort of built-in system of commitment strategies, such that if you try to push me around in ways that I strongly approve, I will fight back very hard. Government is that institution against which we drop those, strat- those commitment strategies. So I, I, when I, in the first edition, I described it as an agency of legitimized coercion, that government is that agency which can do the sorts of things that we would see as outrageous if anybody else did them, but we don't respond to them the way we respond to outrageous things. So if an employer says, we have decided to hire you today, we're going to pay you $15, and if you don't come to work, we're going to put you in jail, we would object very violently to that. When you get a notice saying that you've got jury duty, however, you don't object violently, although that's essentially the terms of the jury duty. It's a much longer term when we had military conscription, but we still have at least conscription for for being on a jury. Uh, If if, if a seller said, here's what I've produced, you're going to get it, you're going to pay for me, you don't have a choice of saying no, we would again regard that as a violation of our rights, except the government does that all the time when it collects taxes for things it's producing. So that's the defining characteristic of government, I think, is that we accept, don't respond to, it's doing the sorts of things which we would strongly object to if anybody else did. How would you define anarchism? I would define it as a society without a government. And that could be good or bad. That is, after all, private people can violate your rights too. Uh, But what I argue in Machinery of Freedom is that one could plausibly have a set of institutions in which there was no government. The useful things governments do, including preventing people from killing you, were being done by private institutions, and the undesirable things weren't being done. And I spend about 
what, I don't know, 80 pages or 90 pages of the book trying to sketch how such a system would work and people can read the book if they want. I can't do it in a minute. If we didn't have a government, wouldn't there be chaos? Uh, there are large parts of life which are not controlled by governments and are not chaotic. Uh, foreign trade, for example, is mostly private in, the, in this world. Uh, governments don't control it, and yet we've got this enormously elaborate inter, interacting interdependent system where goods are made in one country from inputs made in another and sold in the third country and so forth, most of it by private actors. The English language is an enormously complicated construction being shared by what maybe 500 million people, maybe a bit more if you count all the Indians who speak English. Nobody controls it. There is no one who designs the English language. There is no one who tells you how you use words. And yet somehow it's a very orderly system. We get to understand each other uh, with, with, with no government, government control. And it's true of markets in general. So uh, I would have said that if anything, governments tend to create chaos, although they also sometimes reduce it. What are the best examples of a society without a government, if there are any? Yeah, there are a number of historical examples of much earlier societies in which you had nothing that we would recognize uh, as a government. Uh, I suppose the closest one to where we are at the moment would be the Comanche Indians, who were a stateless society, not a very attractive one. Uh, the interesting thing about them is that one of the problems for a, for a stateless society is how do you defend yourself against governments without a government army? And the problem the Comanche proposed was how was everybody else to defend themselves against them because they had a stateless society, but one that was very good at, at, at fighting people uh, and, in fact, did quite an impressive job given that they were heavily outnumbered by people with much higher technology and they still blocked expansion across Texas for 20 years. Uh, a, the one I know most, which is not, I wouldn't call fully stateless, but close, would be Saga Period Iceland. That was a society in which they had a court system and, and they had a legislature, but there was no executive arm of government. So there was no government to enforce the results of the courts. That was entirely private. And that society lasted for about a third of a millennium, a bit over 300 years. And it eventually collapsed, but of course our society went into the civil war less than a century after it was set up. So that's, they did relative, it took them about 250 years to get to their equivalent of, of the American civil war. Uh, so that was a what I think of as a semi-stateless society. Uh, the another interesting one, which people say nasty things about because they don't know anything about it, would be northern Somalia, Somaliland, where you had a society which had institutions for settling disputes, which did not involve the government. And at the point when England ceased being nominally in charge of northern Somalia and Italy ceased being nominally in charge of southern Somalia, they set up a modern centralized democratic government for a society that had never had such a thing. It lasted for a few years to be replaced by a military dictatorship, a rather unpleasant one. The military dictator eventually got thrown out, at which point the U.S. and the U.N. decided that Somalia needed a government. And we've been trying to impose a government on them ever since with very unpleasant results. And the way we try to impose a government on them is to use the troops of e Ethiopia, which is the country next to Somalia, and its traditional enemy. It's a little bit like trying to set up a government in France using German troops. Uh, so Somalia, to the extent it's a mess, is a mess because we've been trying to impose a government on them. And the northern part of it, Somaliland, has in fact set up its own system, mostly along traditional lines with a sort of a very weak government over it and seems to be doing tolerably well. But we aren't willing to recognize them because that would be admitting that there is no such country as Somalia. So that would be another example. But there are a fair number of examples, I think, in the anthropological literature. What we don't have is a modern developed society with no government. And that's what I would like to see. Uh, but I can't give you any examples of that. Obviously, there are lots of chunks of it in the sense of international trade has no government in that sense. And really, the Internet has no real government, which is what we're interacting on at the moment. But you don't have anything that's the equivalent of a country with no government over it. You could say this, the ocean is, I guess, to some extent. We need government to protect us from monopolies. Uh, government is, of course, a monopoly, or tries to be a monopoly, at least, over the use of force. Uh, governments can sometimes reduce monopoly, but governments quite routinely increase monopoly. Uh, 
any tariff tends to increase monopoly because it means you have a smaller market. And if you if you had a high tariff on automobiles, that means that Ford doesn't have to compete with Mercedes. Uh, that governments quite often uh, set up monopolies or cartels. That before deregulation, the U.S. airline industry was a cartel run by the government meaning that if an airline wanted to cut its fares, it had to get permission from the Civil Aeronautics Board, and the other airlines could go to the Civil Aeronautics Board and says, don't let them cut their fares, that'll hurt us. Uh, if they wanted to fly a new route, they had to get permission. That was also true of the trucking industry under regulation, that if you wanted to have a truck line going from Chicago to Detroit, the other trucking companies could go to the Interstate Commerce Commission and say, we've got enough trucks on that route. Don't let them do it. We don't want the competition. So I would have said that although monopolies occasionally occur in a free market society, government on net does much more to promote monopoly than to prevent it. Without government, the poor would not be helped in forms of food stamps or welfare, therefore would die. And this is immoral. Uh, without government, the poor would not be hurt in terms of the sales taxes that they are paying, in terms of the restrictions that keep them from doing things, uh, and that is immoral. That if you, in fact, look at times when there was essentially no welfare, the whole society was much poorer than it now is, but you didn't observe that the poor uh, were dying en masse. Uh, populations kept going up, and those were societies where the bulk of the population uh, was, 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 in fact, poor, not very poor by our standards and even poor by uh, by their standards, that uh, in a very poor society, some people will probably die, but they may die with welfare because the guy giving the welfare decides he doesn't like them, or they may die without welfare because they don't have a job. Uh, but generally, in any reasonably rich society like ours, uh, people can earn enough money to feed themselves. One of the interesting statistics that I came across was the calculation by an economic historian that the if you look at the average income of the world through most of history, the current average income of the world is about 10 times as high as that. And the current average income of the developed world of countries like the US and Western Europe is 20 to 30 times as high as the average income of the world was through most of history. So I don't think we appreciate just how rich we are uh, by historical standards. What is the most important message of your nonfiction book, Law's Order? I don't think there is a most important message. The book is an attempt to use economics to understand law. And that's part of a project that's been going on before I got involved in it. Uh, referred to the economic analysis of law and Law's Order tries to do that. And I hope when you finish reading it, you will understand that law is a much harder problem than people imagine, that it really is not trivial to construct a good legal system. And indeed, one of my arguments for anarchy is that just as governments do a bad job of building cars or growing crops, they also do a bad job of designing law. That designing law is a similarly difficult problem and that you therefore need some system in which the legal rules are being designed on the market rather than by the government. And I try to sketch a way in which that could be done. What is your biggest criticism of the Austrian School of Economics? That's tricky because it depends which Austrian. There is an extreme version of the Austrian position which holds that economics is entirely a priori, that you don't have to look at real world evidence, you just work out the logic and reach your conclusions. And I think that's clearly wrong that as far as I can tell, there are no real world conclusions at all that you can get purely on the ground of theory because theory does not tell you in the economist jargon, either the utility functions or production functions. It doesn't tell you either what people want or what are the ways of getting it. And even real world conclusions that seem very unlikely in terms of economic theory, you can generally think up some logically possible set of utility functions or production functions that would give you that result. So for example, I mentioned that uh, we expect a minimum wage law to result in fewer worker, fewer jobs for low skilled workers. And I would expect that. But you could imagine a society where the consumers really want, enjoy much more buying goods when they're sure that they were made by workers who were paid well. 
And the result is that the consumers value those goods more, and therefore you put in the minimum wage law, there's more demand for those goods than before, and therefore the, the low-skilled workers are better off. It's not what I expect to happen, but it's logically possible. So in my view, the right way of doing economics is to use the theory to form conjectures, to form plausible guesses, but because the system is too complicated in the real world to be sure of your conclusions, you then test those those conjectures against real world predictions. And that's the way I think economics ought to be done. But I'm sure there are people that will consider themselves Austrians who would agree with me. So it's not a, a black and white decision division. It's only that some people in the Austrian school believe that. Now, the other issue is one that I'm not really competent to judge, and that's various theories of the business cycle uh, of what's referred to as macroeconomics. And there, uh, I have been told by people I trust that the Austrian version of that is not consistent with the data, but that's not something I really know about because it's not my field. Uh, but as I say, the, the methodological issue is really the one that interests, that interests me. Uh, any more questions? Yep, yep. just uh, four, four more quick ones. Right. What is the most important thing you learned from Adam Smith? That's a very interesting question, but I think it would take me a while to answer that. Uh, Smith was not a very good theorist. Ricardo was a much better theorist. Smith knew an enormous amount, and he was a very bright guy, and he writes a whole lot about interesting things. Uh, but I can't think of a single lesson that I would say that I have learned from Smith. Maybe there are some lessons that I learned from people who learned from people who learned from people who learned them from Smith, but that's a very different and much more indirect thing. What is the most important thing you learned from David Ricardo? Oh boy. That is theory of comparative advantage, which is the modern understanding of international trade. I didn't learn directly from him, but he, in, he invented it. And uh, I learned it, therefore, through many hands from him. Uh, similarly, uh, the, well, he didn't really invent the Ricardian theory of rent, even though it's named after him, but he did invent Marshallian quasi-rents, which are named after somebody else. And that's, again, a very important set of ideas, which I think I I get from get from him, but again, it's you can't really give one minute answers to these things. That that part of the problem with a lot of courses in the history of economic thought is that what they're teaching is cocktail party conversation. What they're teaching is uh, six sentence descriptions of ideas that take a book to explain. Uh, so uh, I'm an admirer of Ricardo. He's I think the first person who did general equilibrium theory. And he did it with no mathematics beyond arithmetic, which any modern economist would tell you is impossible. But he was a very bright guy and he did, I thought, a very interesting job. So I guess maybe in a way what I learned from him is the use of simplifying assumptions to build models. Because what he did was to make some assumptions that he knew weren't true, make a rough estimate of how untrue they were, of how much they would distort his results and then build a model of the economy which depended on those assumptions because without them the problem was too complicated to solve and that was a very impressive intellectual accomplishment one that i admire if you could recommend one book for everyone in the world to read what would that one book be there isn't any such book different people need different books final question what is the most important thing you learned from your father milton friedman that would be a, a, a bunch of lists. Uh, one of them, I guess, is not to argue about whose fault things are. That his, his attitude was that if we have any question on whose fault it is, it was his fault. As he would say, my shoulders are broad. Uh, that it's a waste of time. Uh, I guess one of the things is to be honest. Uh, one of the things is to, in a certain sense, treat everybody as equals. That is to say that if I was having an argument with my father, the question was not whether he was older and I was younger, but only who had better arguments. And I was having a discussion actually with my older son recently on the question of status and signaling status in various ways. And I said that part of what I admired about my father was that he didn't signal status, that he, as an Englishman would say, he had no side, that he would argue with anybody as equals as long as they had good arguments, so to speak. 
And I've tried to imitate that as best I can, but that was certainly one of the lessons uh, that I learned. But it's hard. I, I learned an awful lot of lessons from him. When I finished my first novel, I concluded that I had modeled the personality of my protagonist on my father. I didn't realize I was doing that, but I think it's pretty clear looking back at it that that's what I was doing. Well, Mr. Friedman, thank you so much for uh, for, for taking uh, the time to do that. Uh, my final comments for the show notes, people. Um, the uh, Ronald Coase books that I would recommend are uh, How China Became Capitalist and his work on lighthouses. And my favorite works of Milton Friedman are from his book, Free to Choose, Who Protects the Worker and Who Protects the Consumer. Two great uh, chapters in that book. Mr. Mr. Friedman. I would recommend for my father would be the first one, Naming Capitalism and Freedom. Excellent. Perfect. I finally got an answer for uh, for, for the one book. Mr. Friedman, thank you so much for your time. I greatly appreciate it. I enjoyed it, too. Bye-bye. In the early days of the Internet, radical libertarians were scattered, lonely, and faceless. Without direction, they resigned to scour the web, sifting through content providers in a wasteland plagued by YouTube demonetization, Facebook jail, and covert internet censorship. But then, in 2017, the Libertarian Union was formed. Finally, the average Joe Libertarian could find a thriving community of independent podcasters and content providers, all in one convenient location. At Libertarian Union, we'll always have the latest news, interviews, discussions, and even movie reviews. With hundreds of episodes and more added all the time, you'll always find something fresh at libertarianunion.com.